could you explain your role in the Kansas City, Missouri School District during the years between 1971 and 1997? I was a sophomore in 71 at Central High School and I graduated in 73. Okay. Yes. And where did you go to grade school? I went to grade school in at Seven Oaks Elementary. I'm not sure if it even exists anymore, mm -hmm. but it's uh, it was on Jackson Street and 39th and Jackson. Jackson. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. That's where I went to elementary school, and and then I went to Central Junior and then Central Senior. Well, at the time, as a student, because I was not an educator. Um, I didn't really keep up with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was not the priority in my life. It was more about, um, you know, just regular life. We were. And what was your school like in terms of integration and the number of students in the I would say that we were a majority African American. Mm -hmm. uh, there may have been a few white students, but I wasn't friends with them, and I don't know for certain. But I know that. We were mostly black. Okay. Yes. Again, for me being a student during that time, that was not something that I heard anybody in my family or my neighborhood talk about integration. That was not a word that was even talked about. Segregation, integration, none of that. No, and I and again I think that that is because I was a student ninth grade tenth grade eleven twelfth the priorities that I focused on were things like boys the prom well who was taking me to the prom you know things like that I probably needed to be looking at those kinds of issues they weren't um, so important. So after you graduated, uh, what did you hear about uh, school integration or school? Well, I, I had heard afterwards, like at college, I went to UM, University of Missouri in Columbia. So for me, <coughs> once I left high school, I was in an integrated environment, which was a real culture shock for me. So I think that was more or less when I really started to pay attention to what segregation was, what integration was, because it was something I experienced. But it wasn't something that I talked about or that was discussed in my classes in high school or in my community at my church, at least not in my presence. It may have been ongoing conversations, of course, but as a kid, uh, I was not included in those conversations. So having come, come out of a segregated setting and all of a sudden at MU in a predominantly white setting, what was that mm -hmm. like for you? The first thing, and, and you might want to cut this, but the first thing that I thought was, they say that we all look alike. That's what I thought, because mm -hmm. everybody white looked alike to me because there were so many, and I couldn't tell them apart until I, you know, during the semester, of course, I started to develop friends with different people, and that helped me to see how differences, we're not our color, we're not our you know, our race or ethnic group, we are individuals. And that's what helped me in that. But prior to that, growing up in uh, where I did in the neighborhood where I grew up, it was, it was I remember white flight happening. Uh, when I was in the kindergarten, my parents moved um, from Kansas City, Kansas to Kansas City, Missouri, to a real neighborhood, because we lived above some somebody's house in Kansas, I don't remember, but it was like, we would go up the back stairs to get to where we lived and it was like a one room flat and my parents had three kids at the time so when they were really excited they worked real hard saved a down a down payment and was buying this house uh, off of 30 um, off of 30 it's at 36 in cyprus in that area and so as a five-year-old and being the oldest this was it was exciting to me that we were gonna have our own room. So those are the kinds of experiences I remember. I do remember white flight and now as an adult knowing what that is, but at the time not knowing what that was, but experiencing that. We had made friends with a couple of the kids in our neighborhood that were white. 
and they were moving and their house was so pretty and I was asking them why are you guys moving this is our new house mm -hmm. and then you're you're moving from a beautiful house why are you moving and they their her their mom said they're moving uh, to get go to a, a better neighborhood mm -hmm. and so I didn't put that together of course but I didn't forget that and uh, sure enough you know within a few years or so uh, it was majority uh, African Americans in our neighborhood. So I'm going to uh, deviate just a little bit um, in terms of your experiences. I know that the two of us discussed an experience that you've had with all of a sudden having a white roommate uh, that had not been accustomed to being around people of color. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that experience, especially when you're having come up in a pretty segregated uh, neighborhood? Mm -hmm. segregated school. Yes, um, <clears throat> that was, like I said, it was a shock for me also to go into an environment that was predominantly white and then to have a white roommate who um, was obviously um, standoffish from me and I didn't understand why. She was, um, she wouldn't talk to me. She acted as though I wasn't even there. It was. And I, and I use this too in my writings that it was like we had an imaginary line between our, our beds in the dorm room where her side was hers and mine was mine and we didn't go to each other's side. And uh, one day uh, her boyfriend came to visit. He was white and he spoke to me which surprised me because she had not talked to me and he noticed this uncomfortable way we were living and he just asked the question and says what you know what's going on between you all and I said and I would call her Amy I said Amy doesn't like me and she said that's not true Gloria that's not true at all she said I've never been around black people before and um, she only had heard about them and she was always told to stay away from us because we steal and we're violent and those kinds of things and so you know and I said well that wasn't applicable to me and so the media had influenced her her um, so the social conditioning of her neighborhood she lived in an all-white town there were no blacks where she lived in a small rural area I think in Iowa and so that was a eye-opener for me and for her too because once her friend uh, sort of broke the ice for us and we got a chance to actually have dialogue about what her the way she was reared versus the way I was reared because I also have been told growing up you know white people are this and you know they don't trust them and and those kinds of things so I had those those in the back of my head as well but when, when we talked it helped us to kind of uh, move past that and to uh, actually we became friends where now we I'd sit on her bed she sit on my bed we could change snacks and you know so it, it broke ice and it also helped her to see that just because I was black or what she had been taught about blacks didn't apply to all blacks and the same for me I learned that just because I thought you know all white people were this way or that way based on what I had been taught that no not necessarily people are individuals and that's what we need to spend our time to focusing on. Unfortunately, I did not hear anything about what was going on. I did read about uh, some of the information that had gone forth in terms of just on my own research about um, Kansas City becoming uh, integrated and what initiatives were behind that, community efforts and things like that. And that, I, I, I gave that article to you that, that outline that but that's how I actually learned about it but when I would come back to Kansas City from my visits you know home visits weekends holidays um, again my family that was just not a conversation that that went forth in my household so we are a product of what we are exposed to One of the things that comes to mind for me is just going back a little bit further when I was like in the seventh or eighth grade when the Kansas City riots happened. Um, that was, that had more impact on me than segregation in terms of seeing uh, the division of, of the city. And because I remember one of my mom's friends lost her only son in that, in the riots. 
And so that impacted me more. And I understood, like, I started to learn about Black Panthers. Um, and and I, I started to align myself with the philosophy of that, uh, even as a student, but not really having a full picture of what, the, what was going on. I didn't have that. Well, here again, being a student at that time, there was my teachers, I don't recall them talking about segregation, integration. Now, what, what, what was the makeup of your teachers? Were they all? Uh, all African American. They were all African American mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. okay. For my friends and classmates, that um, our focus, we were we were okay. I mean, we didn't. That was not an issue for us. But it was our norm. Mm -hmm. It was our norm, so we didn't question that. We didn't, we just lived that, but it wasn't something that we questioned. Okay. Yes. I, I can, a, a situation can, comes to my mind, an experience when I was in seventh grade. Now this was, this was a black family though that was lived in the better neighborhood, if you will. And we were um, on this, the young lady and I were both selected by Sears to be team models, to model their clothes in the store. I was so excited about that. And um, this young lady, she was so polished and so uh, beautiful and you know just had good manners and I didn't grow up in an environment like we never set our table formally we ate how we wanted to and that kind of thing so um, I remember her saying that she wanted to be my friend and and her mom telling her that she couldn't be my friend that we could not be friends because I wasn't like her and she was African-American but that type of experience is what stayed with me of how classism exists mm -hmm. and so it, it just you know it's all to me it's it's deepest layers of so this in those segregated settings you had class issues mm -hmm. okay. yeah can you tell me a little bit more about that well, I just remember the two of us not understanding why her mom wouldn't let us be friends because I lived in a neighborhood that was not acceptable to her. Uh, that it was a hard row and that we were probably, Kansas City was late in starting to, to move toward that direction and the resistance that was there. Um, the courts were involved in um, the state level and I think the federal level even at one point and the, that, those were years after I had left the city and I, I didn't return. So after 74, I relocated to another state and I didn't come back until 2004. So during that period, I wouldn't have much uh, information, but I do know that there was resistance to it and there were uh, uh, ways to get around integrating uh, through you know, busing and um, j dividing lines, changing zoning areas and things like that. My personal experience was that I had great teachers. Uh, I had caring teachers. I had a counselor who, because my, my family didn't finish, high, my parents didn't finish high school. I'm the oldest of four. So the priority was not for me to go to college. And I had not even thought about college. But my counselors and my teachers were the ones that helped me make that move and to get me into MU. Uh, had they not been caring and seeing the potential that I had as a student when I didn't even see that potential, um, that matters, I think. And so um, that was important for me because I think back as to what they had to do in order to invest that time outside of school to help me move forward in what they thought would be a good move for me. Did you see other students experience, have similar experiences in the settings? I saw students, I, I, you know, I don't think that I was the only one that experienced that in terms of their support, their pushing us to be our best, that type of thing. 
because uh, I, um, I remember one of my classes, my English teacher, she, um, we kind of all felt like she was like a mother image because she would, you know, you know, fuss at us and all of that, but we knew she cared about us. And when she would tell us things to do, she meant it because she cared about us. And it wasn't just me, but it was our, our class, the whole class. And so I would say the attitudes from them, their viewpoints, maybe they didn't necessarily express those things with us as students in their classrooms, but I'm pretty sure that they were advocating for what was right and equitable for students on the outside. Well, when, when students, I, I'll say it this way, when when students are not integrated with other people, it hurts everybody because they will at some point interact with other people in the real world. And I think the, that um, segregation limits that and it causes shock. Like for me, when I went to MU, it was a culture shock for me. And I, I had to, it, it took a minute for me to sort of take that all in because I wasn't used to seeing so many white people. And I think that when kids start out young in integrated environments, that it's better for the society in, in general because they learn about differences early on when they're formulating their, um, you know, their thoughts and their ways of being and their personalities and all of that. So I, I definitely think it's, it's a critical, um, it's very important in our society to have integrated environments that are equitable, that students of all races and creeds and colors and backgrounds have opportunity, equal access to resources and opportunities to be their best selves and to develop who they are meant to be. I don't believe that truce would be the dividing line if it, if it were successful. I believe that there would, there would be a lot less prejudice, racist kinds of attitudes, uh, stereotyping, because here again, when you become, when you get to know people, like my roommate got to know me outside of what she had been taught, it changes the landscape. It'll, it'll reconfigure something that wasn't there and make it better. So I definitely think the truce that the whole thing about the truce being the dividing line, that wouldn't exist. That narrative just would not exist. I don't believe it would, yeah. It's funny, uh, the last couple of days, I was working on some, my dissertation and some of the information was dealing with urban. So I was looking up what urban meant. And I even called a city to find out what their definition of urban because many of the articles, and I'm a social worker, so many of the articles that I looked at reflected urban in a very negative term. It was like, the, it was a reflection of negativity. I think that having a whole different perception of what urban is would be very helpful. And not to equate that with poverty and deficit and, you know, uh, everything, violence. And, 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 and it was really interesting because it, it was a, an awakening for me because I use urban. I said, I grew, up, I grew up in the urban core. But I find that in the literature, there's a lot of references to urban, but those references are negative and deficit oriented so, and focused. So what do you think has to happen in order to change that? Image? I I believe that it it, be, it begins with people becoming knowledgeable mm -hmm. about what is what really is. And I I believe strongly in diversity trainings, um, conversations, having conversations with different others, uh, different from yourselves to uh, in safe environments where you don't feel that you'll be threatened or you have to defend yourself, but that you can be open and honest. And I go back to my roommate situation. We, we both felt safe enough to say our truths and that 
is what I believe has to happen. I don't believe that you can, and it's been proven that you can't legislate a, a, a mind change and heart change. That doesn't happen through laws of men or policies written, or we, we've seen that from slavery. That, that's not going to bring about the change. Uh, what brings about change is change in people's minds and hearts. And that is what I believe has to happen first before we'll see real change, uh, societal, or global change, uh, community change. It, there has to be change in people, in the way they think and what they believe and what they value. I feel very fortunate that on the flip side of integration. I feel fortunate that even though it was a segregated environment for me, that I had good teachers and I had good people who cared about what happened to me and my other fellow students. There was a concern, a genuineness that was there. There was not the push for the no child left behind and the standards and the, the, the things that take teachers now away from caring and loving and being what students need them to be in their lives, but they're more focused on numbers and, and dollars and you know funding and all of the things that take away from developing, the, using that small amount of time that kids are at school to, to help develop and nurture them to be who they are meant to be. You know, so I, I definitely feel fortunate that I had that experience of having teachers not be, um, you know, focusing on the things that now teachers have to be concerned about even to keep their jobs.